So my background, I started out life as an atheist in an atheist family, then became a bit of an agnostic, you know, not sure whether God existed or not. I became a Christian in my 20s and was a creationist for a year or so. Uh, Then I became an evolutionist, so a Christian who believes in evolution uh, as well as God. And now continue to struggle to uh, work out what it means to be a 21st century disciple with uh, all that we have from the scriptures and church tradition and all that we're learning from the sciences and from each other and uh, continue faithfully to follow Jesus today. I've got atheist and agnostic and Christian friends still. Uh, Some of them are single, some are married, some are divorced, some are single parents, some are bisexual, some are straight, uh, some don't know what they are, some are creationists and some are evolutionists, which uh, makes it sound like I have a lot of friends, but actually some of them overlap, so there's really not all that many. Um, I've been single, happily single at some times, and really unhappily single, wishing I could find someone at other times. Uh, I've been married, I was divorced, and I've been married again, and uh, now married with a couple of kids living up in Bellingen. If you're a creationist and take the Genesis story literally, that's fine. Just tune out for about 10 minutes. Once we get to the Old Testament, everything will be relevant to you from then on. Let's start with some acknowledgements. Life is beautiful. Life is ever-changing. It's this stream of abundance and diversity, this incredible tapestry that we can hardly imagine. Every generation reproducing and passing on offspring to the next generation. Acknowledge that it's actually the microbes and all of their relationships that shape most of the life on Earth of this planet. They're the ones that got us to where we are. We rely on them completely. There's the plants and the algae, without whom we would have no oxygen to breathe with all of their reproduction and relationships. And there's all those tiny little creatures that break down our waste and stop this place turning into a huge rubbish dump. We might want to acknowledge our human ancestors who have been reproducing and raising children and surviving for millions of years. Every one of you here has ancestors that have successfully raised children and helped to raise children for generation after generation back a couple of hundred thousand years as homo sapiens, a couple of million years as humans before that, and all the way back to the beginning of life. We come from an incredibly long line of adaptable survivors, and quite often in my life I find that an encouraging thought. No, we have survived so much to get where we are. I want to acknowledge the wonder of sex, which makes life here possible and all of us, and which for the last few million years, amongst primates at least, has actually started to be fun. It hasn't been fun for most of the history of life, but most of us enjoy it now. Acknowledge Jesus, who also reminds us of the value of a single life. The church sometimes talks a lot about relationships and marriage and all that stuff, but we need to remember that Jesus spoke much more about the value of a single life, as did Paul. And just take a second to acknowledge each other. Look at this incredible diversity of humanity that uh, sexual reproduction has come up with. If we just kept cloning ourselves, there'd only be one of us in the world, but instead there's all of this amazing variety here. Of course, we don't need evolutionary biology to encourage us to rethink marriage and sex in the church. The church has been having these discussions for a long time, although we haven't always known that. The church's attitude to both has changed over the last couple of thousand years. Our attitude to sex and bodies and marriage and women has changed a lot. We can't argue directly from evolution to morality and ethics, okay? So just to say something's natural or this is the way things have evolved doesn't mean that's the way it will necessarily continue now. And evolution, of course, doesn't say all there is to say about marriage and sex. Having said that, it does say a bit. Including this poem that I wanted to read to you, and it's the best attempt I can come up to explain all that the scientists have told us about the evolution of sex um, over the last 500 million years in a poem. Sex is fun, but that's not why we do it. It's only fairly recently that evolution grew it. Still, I hope we'd all agree when all is said and done, that we do like sex, sex is fun. I acknowledge that not everyone here will be able to comment on that, but at some point in your life, possibly you will be. Of course, most creatures of Earth don't even do it at all. They just split in half and then off they crawl. Then homosexuality was the first revolution. There was only one gender for most of evolution. Now we have genders, but not just two. Some species have dozens. Yes, that's really true. Then we have all those whose gender bends. They switch back and forth. It just never ends. Fish girls become boys, become women, become men in this cycle that repeats again and again. Even when our gender stays fixed, things still get a little mixed. XO, XX, XXX, XXXX, XXXX. That's just the female sex. 
xy, xxy, xxxy, xxxxy, xyy. There are all kinds of variations on the male side. And if you think that's a little absurd, the whole thing is reversed when we come to birds. I'm an XY, but a boy bird is ZZ. And there may be more we don't know about yet. I'm not really sure about reading this one here in the chapel, but anyway. <laughs> sea sponges can have sex or do it alone. On a whim, they can mate or they can clone. Of course, when they do have sex, there is no penetration. They just squirt it all out and hope for fertilisation. <laughs> Those sponges have orgies of unheard of degrees. Think about that when you swim in the sea. <laughs> Too much? Too much. <laughs> Creatures that do penetrate usually have no fun. Just to survive is the main rule of thumb. Male spiders get eaten, unless they're clever. Lots do it once, most bees do it never. Birds orgasm in the blink of an eye. Antichinus do it, then crawl off and die. But bonobos, that's a kind of chimp, do it with whoever they can, and then they do it again and again. Sex seems to be fun for so many primates, especially bonobos and us hairless apes. But sex is dangerous. You get dead a lot. So why did life just say, I'd rather not? Sex in all its forms has evolved to help us to fight off the common cold. Well, really, to fight off the more deadly types of viruses, bacteria and parasites. We shuffle the deck when we combine our gametes. It's infection by germs which sex evolved to help us defeat. Sure, we love sex now and we think it's great, but it evolved to help us recombinate. And if there were no germs, there would be no sexuality. A whole lot of fun came from avoiding that calamity. Now, while drawing morals straight from evolution would be really kind of dumb, sometimes so is quoting Genesis like some God-given rule of thumb. Some say God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. But we know that's rubbish. First, all sex was same sex and didn't life flourish. Often at a wedding you will hear that God gave marriage. But sometimes that can be a bit of Genesis-inspired baggage. Evolution tells us that it certainly took a while. And it's not like Western monogamy is the only human style. Sure, marriage is great for a stable society. But that's the very thing Jesus threatened. He died a man of notoriety. Yet my wife and I subscribe to it using contraception. Well, most of the time there's been two conceptions. A lovely little boy and another just arrived. The planet's <coughs> overcrowded, but we're still glad they survived. Other friends have no kids, though they have often tried. And it doesn't help when people say, no, it's for God to decide. Babies come when a sperm makes it to an egg. Not when God decides it. We don't have to beg. Now, sex to get our kids was a highlight bar none, but we're not having any others, and sex is still fun. At least I hope it will be after I get the snip. It's lucky I'm not a Catholic, but a Protestant. <laughs> These days, Christians say sex is great for a married woman and a man. The problem is they often then say that nobody else can. But any ethic which ignores the fact that we've evolved is an ethic that will leave many problems still unresolved. I can't give you all the answers in a silly little poem, or if it did, it wouldn't all rhyme, and I can't stand that. <laughs> but by now, it should be obvious to any sensibilities that heterosexual marriage doesn't exhaust all possibilities. I can't vouch for bloke to bloke, though about it many rave, or where there's only women, but for some friends, that's the fave. Enough already, you either get the point or you stopped listening long ago. If you haven't started having sex, you should probably take it slow. Sex should be a lot of fun, but it isn't always so. Sex is spiritual, mystical, emotional, relational, luminous, numinous, even educational. The Bible had a point when it says it makes us one, even if it evolved to avoid those pathogens. Now the poem's nearly over, and because I am a priest, I'll leave you with this little thought, which might be a start at least. The future church calls people to love of God and neighbour and self to relationships which express a righteousness which is modelled on Jesus the Christ, informed by evolutionary biology, and appropriate to our current context. Freed from a simplistic application of Genesis with its very static view of creation. It's from a talk I gave last year, the internet it's on, Google Christian sex and evolution, and then add Jason John. <laughs> So we're still roughly on time. So just to summarise, in case you were 
so entranced by the poem you didn't get all the points. What I'm wanting to do is highlight some differences in the way Genesis has understood uh, the origins of sex and sexuality and relationships and the way evolutionary biology suggests it. So the main point is sexual reproduction has evolved. At first there was uh, no sex at all, organisms just cloned in half and then continued. Uh, then there was uh, unisexual, or if you want to be a bit cheeky, homosexual uh, relationships. That was, there was only one gender in all of life. But then it became increasingly useful for some organisms in the species to actually hold on to their gametes and just wait and collect the gametes that were floating around. It made it more likely that they would be able to successfully have offspring. And that's where male and female started to eventually evolve. And now we have heterosexual relationships, but birds have evolved down a completely different path than us. So in birds, it's the female that has different sex chromosomes, the kind of XY, and the males are um, XX, but they call them Zs. So there was no gender, then there were dual genders, and now there are variable genders. Some organisms have dozens of gender. Okay, all gender is really is working out within a species whether two members of that species can breed or not. Okay, so if you take... Uh, something from the male gender and female gender, you can get an offspring. From the male and male, you can't. Female and female, you can't. But for some organisms, there's about 12 different varieties, so you've got to get compatible genders amongst all of that. Sex initially evolved as an advantage against pathogens. Okay? That's the best uh, story that people can come up with as to why we have sex, because it takes so many resources, it's so dangerous, that's the reason we do it. And there's been an expansion of the function of sex. It was all about reproduction and survival. In the mammals, and especially in primates, it's also become about pleasure. And primates, particularly bonobos and chimpanzees and humans, now have sex just for fun, with absolutely no thought of reproducing. And in fact, in some humans, we now actively try not to reproduce while we're having sex. So in terms of the relationship between parenting or partnering and sex in life, it went from there were no parents, you just split in half, then there was no parenting. For most of life, organisms have just tried to have offspring and then leave them to their own devices and see what survives. But increasingly, over time, more and more creatures have put more and more investment into actually trying to nurture their offspring into the future. And of course, we're probably the prime example of that. The relationship of parenting and sex in us, it's thought that for most of our history, human beings have been nomadic, and monogamy actually hasn't been all that common. We're talking about small groups of people, maybe 50, maybe 200 people, travelling around this vast world, rarely coming into contact with other tribes, and when they do, sometimes exchanging uh, partners. There was a shared care of children. There were no possessions to worry about. There was nothing to hand on to your children to make sure they inherited and nobody else got. So there was a much different attitude to reproduction and to looking after children. And everyone needed to cooperate together to survive. Tribes and groups that didn't cooperate well, that didn't all look after each other's kids, tended to die. So polygamy was a huge uh, part of human sexuality and relationships and continues to be in a small form around the world. There would be a lot more of it except for the fact that Christian missionaries, as they travelled around the world, insisted that people become monogamous. There have been a bunch of marriage forms. I'm not talking about it next week. We'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, polygyny is pretty rare, where there's um, only one woman and several men, but that has existed, and various forms of monogamy. And now we have sex without parenting for fun. So when we kind of compare the, the uh, impression we get from Genesis with what the evolutionists are encouraging us to look at, um, Genesis assumed everything was fixed. We all know the story. God said this and it happened. God said this and it happened. God said this and it happened. Everything in its place and its time and according to its kind and fixed, and we've tended to run with that assumption. But life is much more fluid and adaptive and evolved than that. And driven by the environment and context, and I guess that's the one point I want to make, life for hundreds of millions of years has adapted uh, the relationships between organisms and the way they have their children according to the environment that they're living in. And I think we see that in the Old Testament and the New Testament and today. So. We're going to go into the Old Testament now. I guess the main thing I'd want to say is when we read the Old Testament passages, we can't just import them directly into our context. We need to look at how they lived faithful relational lives and spiritual and sexual lives in their context and what it can teach us about ours. Where our contexts are the same might have a lot to say. Where they're different might be different. This was originally an eight-week series of uh, eight sessions over eight weeks, uh, which I've tried to crunch down into this hour.
So let's take one deep breath. That was 500 million years. Now we're just looking at 1,000 years. Not comprehensively, but just to try and flag some things that we often don't notice when we talk about the scriptures. And particularly, uh, some of you would be aware, we're heading towards, or we're in a discussion about a theology of marriage at the moment. And uh, my hope is that when we do that, we will actually remember all of the richness of the Christian scriptures about that. Um, Sometimes people just want to say we should live according to the biblical norm, but we'd need to ask which one. I want to start with something positive. And I should have said that if you're under 21, you should probably close your eyes at the moment because you're not meant to read this, at least not when it was written. This is the Song of Solomon. In fact, unless you're male, you should be closing your eyes. And in fact, amongst the men, only those of you who are married are allowed to read this. Okay, But living in the permissive 21st century as we do, we'll let everybody read the Bible today. And I'll just read you like a little bit of it, because it's worth remembering that the Hebrew people, in many ways, were a lot less hung up about sex than we sometimes are, particularly in the Western church, although in some other ways, much more so. So this is, this is the Hebrew sealed section of the scriptures. You weren't allowed to read it unless you're a 20-year-old, 21-year-old male who was married. And this is why. My love is a gazelle, a wild stag. There he stands on the other side of our wall, gazing between the stones. He says, your breasts are two fawns, twins of a gazelle, grazing in a field of lilies. Kiss me, make me drunk with your kisses. Your sweet loving is better than wine. Awake, north wind, O south wind, come, breathe upon my garden. Let its spices stream out. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its delicious fruit. Is that enough? You get the gist. (laughs) You can read the whole thing later, but sex is good in the Old Testament, okay? At least in this verse. Now, the hysterical thing, of course, is that many Western Christians, uh, particularly in England, could not cope with this at all and had no idea why it was in the Bible at all. And so what they said is, well, this isn't really about two people. It's a metaphor for God and the church, which is hysterical. (laughs) I invite you to read the Song of Solomon and work out which one's meant to be God and which one's meant to be the church. And if you can not laugh, then um, you'd be doing better than me. But it kind of shows just how much trouble we had with the idea that uh, people might enjoy sex and actually write about it and talk about it. So let's look at some of the more troubling aspects uh, of sexuality and relationships in the Old Testament. Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Adar and the name of the other was Zillah. Got a whole lot in the notes here, but all I'll say there is that uh, polygamy was part of the Hebrew tradition from about the seventh generation. If you start with Adam and start reading the Bible, within seven generations we're at Lamech with his two wives. And that made sense for many reasons, one of which was that in that culture where there's a lot of war going on, when you read the Old Testament, you see they're always battling and fighting. Lots of the men are being killed in wars, so you end up with few men and a whole lot of women. If women aren't allowed to own property and are basically just chattel, then the only way that women are going to survive is if they've got a husband. But if a whole bunch of the husbands are dead, what do you do? Well, you marry lots of women to one man. So in their context... Polygamy made perfect sense. And as I said, all around the world, different cultures have decided that polygamy makes sense for them at times. But it doesn't always go well. Sarah, Abraham's wife, took her slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband as a wife. That's an interesting ethic for sexuality in the 21st century. He went into Hagar and she conceived, and when she saw she'd conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So then Jacob goes into Rachel as well. Oh, sorry, this is a different story. Where we have a... Jacob, who wants to marry Rachel, but he gets given her sister first, and then he works for another seven years and gets given Rachel. So he uh, loved Rachel more than Leah, but when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. So polygamy worked to keep women alive and to keep them in touch with some resources, but it didn't always go all that well. Jealousy is a pretty common human emotion. Different people have come up with different ways to try and mediate that a bit. But... um, Yeah, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Just because polygamy happened doesn't mean it's necessarily a good idea now. And the other thing, of course, that was happening uh, back then was around divorce. And because women were treated as property, men were able to get rid of them fairly freely, but not all the prophets were happy about that. Let the Lord be a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Don't be faithless to the wife of your youth. In other words, 
Marry more women, sure, but don't then dump the old one because what's she going to do to make a crust? You have to keep all of your women. And we see it in the Ten Commandments, this thing about property. And if it seems like I'm banging on a bit too much about women being property, we need to remember that whenever we're reading anything about the sexuality and relationships of the Old Testament. Don't cover your neighbour's house or any of their other stuff, including their woman. To make that even more emphatic, if you buy a male Hebrew slave, he's got to serve you for six years, but then goes free in the seventh. But if you've given him a woman to be his wife and he's had some kids, you get to keep the woman and the kids. He doesn't keep, he can go free, but you get the woman and the kids to keep working for you. Another incredible sexual and uh, relational ethic. Yes, marriage is fine, but it's not a lifelong union. It only lasts for as long as you belong to your master. And then after that, you split and uh, the master gets the kids and the wife. Even when love was involved, the path wasn't smooth. And that's, as I said, this is the story of uh, Jacob, who loved Rachel, worked for seven years to get her, and then got Leah as well. Sometimes love was involved, but there was also some kind of pragmatism, as we see in the second verse there. The congregation sent 12,000 soldiers, this is the Hebrew people, and commanded them, go to the inhabitants of Gabish Gilead and put them to the sword. All the women and the little ones, every male and every woman that's lain with a male, devote to destruction. In other words, if the woman's had sex and therefore might be pregnant, kill her. But all the virgins that you find, take them and we'll give them to this tribe of uh, Judah who don't have any wives. Very pragmatic, hardly an ethic that we want to bring into the 21st century. Men could have sex with their wives, of course, with more than one and with their concubines and with any other woman as long as they don't already belong to a man or they weren't worth some money to their father. If a woman was raped, that was judged on property grounds. If she was engaged or married, then she already belonged to someone else, so the man was killed. But if she was a virgin, then the punishment was to preserve the social order and to protect her a little bit. So if you meet a virgin who's not engaged and sees and lie with her and you get caught, then you've got to pay 50 shekels to the woman's father and she'll become your wife and you're never allowed to divorce her. That's the only woman you can't divorce is someone that you raped and got caught raping. Because if she was cast aside, it's very unlikely that anybody else would take her. And here, how's this for a sexual ethic? When a man dies and has no son, his brother shall go into the wife and take her in marriage so the firstborn can be named after the father. And of course, in the Hebrew scriptures, women are allowed to insist if their husband dies that their brother-in-law take them in and have sex with them and continue the family line. Women have to be virgins when they're married, but it's assumed that men won't be. And the use of prostitutes in the Old Testament is simply mentioned. If you read everything about prostitutes in the Old Testament, it's just what you do, unless you're a woman, as we'll come to in a second. Proverbs has this advice for the blokes. Keep your father's commandments and don't forsake your mother's teaching. To preserve you from the wife of another, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Adultery was very bad because the women belonged to other men. And if you commit adultery, they might end up pregnant with your child and not the bloke's child, not their husband's. Don't desire the beauty of a married woman in your heart or let her capture you with her eyelashes. A prostitute's fee is only a loaf of bread, but the wife of another stalks a man's very life. And it goes on to basically say, if you have sex with someone's wife, they're going to come after you and kill you. Who would want to do that when for a loaf of bread you could sleep with a prostitute? Different matter if you're a woman. Good Jewish men sleep with prostitutes, but good Jewish girls are burnt alive if they are one. Tamar's story. Does everyone know the story of Tamar? I'll, I'll, let's skim over it. So uh, Tamar, uh, her husband dies and she comes to her father-in-law and says, right, give me your next son to be my husband, as is my right, but he refuses. So uh, she's in trouble. What's she going to do for a crust? So she throws off her widow's garments, puts on a veil, sits by the side of the road. Her father-in-law comes past, thinks he's a prostitute because she's covered her face, says, come on, let me come into you. And she says, only if you'll give me your signet ring and staff as a pledge which he does, and then he goes off. Three months later, he finds out that his daughter-in-law, Tamar, has been acting as a prostitute. Moreover, she's pregnant as the result of her whoredom. So he says, bring her out and let us burn her. And she was brought out, but she sent to her father-in-law the signet ring and the staff that he'd given her when he slept with her. And suddenly he goes, oh, okay, she's actually in the right more than I am. You can have my second son to be your husband after all. And he doesn't lie with her again, which is reassuring given that she's his daughter-in-law so 
using prostitutes is fine. Being a prostitute will get you killed. Even, if, uh, even not being a virgin if you're a woman is a capital offence. Marrying lots of women is okay. Raping a virgin is okay, but then you have to marry her and can't divorce her. But some marriages aren't okay, and particularly this one. When the Jews come back from exile in Babylon and start rebuilding the city and reforming their faith, this incredibly disturbing thing happens. And it's recorded here in Ezra. The people are convinced by the prophet of their sin and they sit down and say, we've broken faith with our God and we have married foreign women from the people of the land around us. But even now there is hope for us despite the fact that we married foreigners. Let us make a covenant with God to send away all these wives and their children. If any man refuses to divorce his wife, all of their property will be taken from them and they themselves will be thrown out. Okay? Marrying foreigners is a very, very bad thing to do. And if you do, you must divorce them and cast them out, even though to cast out a bunch of women and their kids, the likely result for those women and kids is going to be very unpleasant. If you actually have some integrity and refuse to divorce your wife, then you get thrown out as well. To argue that the Bible is against divorce is incredibly simplistic. This is even more disturbing, I reckon. What happens if you go away to war and come back and you think your wife's got knocked up by somebody else? There's a bit of a bump showing and you accuse her of having slept with somebody. This is what happens in Judaism. If a man becomes jealous of his wife and thinks he's had an affair but he can't prove it, they go to the priest. The priest makes her take this oath. If you've gone astray under your husband's authority and defiled yourself with some other man, now may this water that brings the curse Enter your bowels and make your womb discharge and your uterus drop. In other words, if you suspect your wife of having had an affair and being pregnant, the priest gives her a potion which will cause her to have an abortion. She drinks it. If she does have the abortion, then everyone knows that she was guilty and she's stoned to death. If she drinks it and doesn't, then she's declared guiltless and the husband is fined and never allowed to divorce her again either. So in the particular situation of a man being suspicious that his wife has slept with another man and got pregnant, the Bible doesn't just condone but actually demands abortion. <coughs> Again, that's a surprise to some people. The Bible isn't against abortion, carte blanche. I don't think we've got time for that one. Let's have a quick recap. Actually, we haven't even got time for that. Let's keep rolling on. <laughs> oh, let's, let's recap that bit. So this is the Old Testament. Okay. And even if you don't believe everything that I've said, you can go and look up those verses. But here's the context in which we need to approach the Old Testament when we think about our current theology of marriage. It assumes polygamy, at least if you're wealthy enough to have more than one wife, or if your, brother's wife, if your brother dies and you need to take on his wives. Condones having sex with prostitutes, but not being one. Recommends prostitutes in preference to married women because it's much cheaper and less dangerous. Insists on female virginity, but assumes that males will be promiscuous. Makes men who force sex on virgins pay compensation and marry the woman. Allows men to divorce women except for a very few circumstances and insists on divorce in the case of mixed marriage and insists on abortion or termination in the case of infidelity. Why? Because it's all about the man and his property and there'd be nothing worse than your wife being pregnant to someone else because then their kid will get your property. They lived in an environment where they, had, they were a pretty small population Men died in wars. Men owned all the property, including women and children. So husbandless women were really vulnerable. Barren women were shamed or cursed, and all through the Old Testament, to not be able to produce children is seen as a terrible curse. There's no protection from sexually transmitted diseases, of course. Contraception basically means just trying to withdraw in time, which again is condemned, and there's the story of the man whose brother dies and whose wife insists that he sleeps with her, but he spills his seed on the ground instead of inside her and keeps doing it till she realises what he's up to and he gets in terrible trouble and insists. And, um, yeah, small population, so they're trying to grow. Everything is about getting more and more people so the Jewish nation can get bigger, especially when the men keep dying in wars. The purpose of the laws was to grow that small population, expand the kingdom, to maintain this patriarchal community where men owned everything and got to hand on what they owned to the next generation, to protect male property rights, and to offer some protection for women from abject poverty. That's the context they lived in, that's what they were trying to do, and that's how I believe those laws arose. In the Hebrew scriptures, everything is about getting married and having as many kids as you can. 
By the time we get to the New Testament, obviously that's very different, and being single and not having children becomes highly prized. So the environment in the Gospels, or the early church, again, it was still a small population, but a lot more urban now. There was less war because the Romans were in charge of everything, so it was, there weren't many rebellions left. Not so many people were dying, not so many men. But there was a lot more oppression going on. Men still owned all the property in Jewish systems, but not in the Gentile system, so you see that playing itself out. But Christians are called to renounce all of their money by Jesus. Unless you forsake all your possessions, you can't be my disciple. Husbandless Jewish women are still very vulnerable. Barren women are still shamed and cursed. Still, there's no protection from sexually transmitted diseases and no great contraception going on. And there was a growing, in the early church, this growing sense of the equality of men and women, which then kind of peters out pretty quickly. A huge difference between the Christians and the Jewish way of thought is that they thought the world was about to end. Paul's writings, the book of Revelation, are full of this sense that any day now, the Son of God is coming back in the clouds, bringing this world to an end. Okay, So why get married? Why have kids when the kids probably won't even start to grow up before Jesus comes back? So the purpose of life is to focus on this coming kingdom that you can lay hold of now and it will be here any minute. Renounce your property? What's the point of keeping property? It's going to be no good to you in a few days or maybe a year's time when Jesus comes back. Redefining community completely. Jesus totally redefined community to not be about biological relationships but to be about following God. And protecting vulnerable women was still important. Let me just skim really quickly. You can look at these verses later and you're probably more familiar with these anyway. We know that Paul wasn't all that keen on marriage. He says as a means of concession that basically if you're full of passion, if you burn with passion, if you can't stop yourself from having sex with someone, then at least marry them. That's better than just uh, burning with passion. But that's a concession. I wish everyone was single like me. To widows, I say it's better to remain unmarried as I am, but if you, practice self, if you can't practice self-control, then get married. It's better to marry than be aflame with passion, which is a pretty depressing way of looking at marriage. I like to think be aflame with passion in marriage, but anyway. If his passion is strong and it has to be, then let him marry as he wishes. It's no sin. Okay, so in Paul's thinking, marriage far from this celebrated, wonderful thing that we've come to church to celebrate in front of everyone, it's not actually a sin. If you can't keep it in your pants, then do it, but I'd really rather you didn't. That's really different from the way we usually talk about marriage in the church, isn't it? Why? Why not get married? Well, as I said, the appointed time has grown sh short. If we just look at the yellow, those who buy should live as if they had no possessions, for the present form is passing away. Be free from anxiety. Getting married will make you anxious. It makes the men anxious for their wife instead of the work of the Lord, and women anxious uh, for their husband instead of the work of the Lord. And in that, Paul's introducing this real equality, like he's just as concerned that women be disciples as men. But marriage will stop you being devoted to the Lord, according to Paul. Let's look at Jesus. He wasn't favourable towards marriage either, despite what we often claim at weddings. It's a gross overstatement, I think, to say that Jesus was in favour of marriage. So his disciples. So what does he say about marriage? Well, not everyone can accept the teaching that it's better not to touch a woman, but only those to whom it's given. Let anyone accept it who can. If you can handle the calling to be single, then you should. But if you can't, still, it's not a sin. Peter says, God, uh, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. Jesus says, there's no one who's left house, and the word is actually put aside, which is the same word for divorce. There is no one who has put aside their house or their wife or well, their brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom that won't be given a whole lot more. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and brother and sister. Get away from this biological relationship to each other. Call no one your father because you've only got one father, God. To say that in a Jewish context was really, really radical. Every now and then I hear that certain groups in society are undermining the family. I don't know if you've ever heard that accusation put to people. This is the guy whose fault it is. It all started with Jesus. If you want to look at someone who's undermining family, undermining biological ties, undermining uh, the nuclear family, it's Jesus. Okay, He started it. I'm not going to read any of that, but when it comes to possessions, we know everything Jesus said about possessions was basically get rid of them. Okay, It's a fair enough summary of that entire page. <laughs> so when we look at at these environments, and again I was saying relationships evolve in different environments. In the Old Testament, 
Love God, love your neighbour as yourself. We're trying to grow a population, maintain property rights for men, protect women. We're building an earthly kingdom. Marriage is good, polygamy is good, breeding is good, men are in control, women vulnerable. There's no contraception, there's no safe sex. Prostitution is morally indifferent unless you're the prostitute and barrenness is shameful. In the early New Testament, when Jesus was around, we need to spread the gospel before the end comes. That's the point, not trying to grow a kingdom here on earth. We're spreading the gospel. Money's irrelevant, get rid of it. Marriage is irrelevant, don't bother with it. It's a hindrance. We want to destabilise the biological family. You owe no allegiance to your father anymore. You don't owe no allegiance to your mother. You only owe allegiance to God and all the other people who are following God with you, spreading the gospel. We owe no allegiance to hierarchy or patriarchy. There's no point in capital. Of course, Greek women were a bit more independent than Jewish women at the time. So it's very radical when Paul and Jesus treat women as they do. A bit later in the New Testament, still in the writings, it's still about loving God and neighbour as self. We're still spreading the gospel, but the world hasn't ended. People are starting to notice that Jesus maybe isn't coming back every day now. It's been, you know, decades since he left. Property is becoming relevant, and the church is having to start relying on property, particularly Gentile women who were quite wealthy. So it becomes about sharing. Everything in the, the epistles becomes about sharing your property, not getting rid of it, as Jesus encouraged us to do. The church is being persecuted. We're freaks. People are talking about this horrible cult of people that's arising that eat flesh and drink blood. And uh, Nero finds it really easy to start burning Christians to distract from his terrible uh, rulership. In that context, the church wants to show everyone else that actually we're kind of normal and just like you. And so the writings become more about marriage uh, and respectability and fitting in with society. So we go from Jesus saying, be single if you can accept it. And Paul, saying he wishes everyone was like him, to starting to talk about bishops should be the, ma- the husband of only one wife. Incidentally, that's not about divorce, that's about polygamy. In the early church, there were polygamous relationships, but if you wanted to be bishop, you should only have one wife. You must be well thought of in society. Young widows should marry instead of going on the pension. And 2 Timothy, of course, then really starts to set in this stuff about women's subordination so that they fit in a bit better to the society around them again. Based on Eve, you know, that woman who was so stupid she listened to the serpent and the bloke listened to her and everything went wrong. So let's not let women talk in church or lead us because of the disaster that happened back then. And then by Hebrews we get to honouring the marriage bed in front of all. Completely different from what Jesus and Paul were talking about. Except for divorce. All I will say about divorce is that it's really, really complicated in the scriptures. I spent a lot of time trying to understand what Jesus was talking about, what the early church was on about. If someone tells you uh, or reckons they can get it across to you really simply what's going on, they've either read a lot more than me or they haven't read anything much at all except maybe a verse and they're applying it to you. Let me say a tiny bit about divorce. Let me just give you the conclusion. You can read the notes later and see if you agree. In Mark's gospel, okay, the earliest gospel where Jesus talks about divorce, There's no clause about sexual infidelity. It's just pretty straightforward. The Pharisees come to test him. They ask whether they can get divorced. He says, no, it's because of your hardness of heart. And uh, at the end of it also talks about a woman divorcing a man, which of course couldn't happen in Jewish society. The conclusion that I think uh, comes out of this is that basically what Jesus is doing clearly isn't encouraging people to get married because he's said that. But once you are married and particularly if you're a Jewish bloke who's wanting to cast off that wife of your youth and get another one, Jesus is saying, no, you can't just do that. You can't cast off the wife of your youth. Technically, sure, you can, but in God's eyes, that's actually adultery. To just dump your wife and get a new one is just as bad, is is adultery. You can't do it. He's concerned to look after women, basically, and what he says about divorce. Matthew introduces the bit about uh, sexual immorality, so you can get divorced if your partner uh, has cheated on you. It seems most likely to me that that's something that Matthew added in, not something that Jesus said originally, for a couple of reasons. One, every other thing that Jesus says about sin is that we're meant to forgive those who sin against us, not seven times, but 70 times seven. The only unforgivable sin he talks about is the sin against the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't specify what that is. It seems incredible that he would say you need to forgive others for everything that they do to you over and over again unless your partner cheats on you. Okay, Domestic violence, forgive that. 
theft, forgive that, lying, forgive that, everything else except for sexual immorality. I don't think that happened. I think Matthew's adding this for his community. Another reason he has to add it, I think, is if we remember the story of Joseph. Joseph was a righteous man. He was a good man, but he was about to divorce Mary because he suspected that she'd had sex with somebody else. So in Matthew's Gospel, if Joseph was about to divorce Mary, then he's actually not doing what Jesus had said. So I think Matthew adds that clause to enable Joseph to continue to be a righteous man. Like I said, all of these pages talk about divorce, and maybe on the stool we can talk about it later. We've got ten minutes to go. Let me pick out a couple of slides. Comparing the New Testament to today. The New Testament doesn't really talk about sex before marriage. Okay, as a concept, I don't think that concept really existed. Or sex after marriage. We know lots of people now uh, either get divorced or widowed and have a long life ahead of them to think about what it's going to mean for them to have relationships. The legal age of marriage for a Jewish man was 13 and a half years old. And the legal age for a girl was 12 and a half. And often they were betrothed before that, so it was already lined up who you were going to end up with. Puberty was about 15. So this big chunk of time that we now have between when we hit puberty and when we get married, particularly if we're wanting to save for a house and do all that sensible stuff, get a career going before we have children and so on, is huge. That 10 to 20 year gap never existed in the New Testament. It's not surprising that they didn't have the kind of discussions that we're having now. Not only that, but um, if people didn't survive nearly as long in the uh, New Testament times as we do, and so this sense of you know, maybe becoming a widow in your late 50s or 60s and then wondering what you're going to do with the rest of your life didn't happen anyway. It didn't tend to happen very often. If you lived to 40, you were doing really well. Back then, women needed to remarry to survive. That's not so much a part of our culture these days, not in the last few decades anyway. It won't be the case for any of you. As I said, life expectancy is longer and marriages now last 60 to 80 years instead of maybe 17 to 20 years back then. Population growth in the Old Testament was highly prized. Barrenness was a curse, as I said. Not having sex and not reproducing then was a terrible thing to do. Why would you be in a relationship and having sex with someone and not trying to breed more Jewish people to help us build our nation? It was just inconceivable that we would want to do that. We're going to skip over this. I was going to talk a bit about same-sex stuff, but I won't. We've talked about that more than enough in church, except maybe briefly to say, as has probably been pointed out before, that... Uh, that quote's actually wrong. Malachi 1.3 uh, says that God hates Esau, not fags. But the gist of it is there. God hates a whole lot of stuff. There's a lot of abominations in the Old Testament. Adultery, we probably wouldn't have a problem with that. Periods are very horrible things. And it's an abomination to have sex with your wife when she's having her period. Just as bad as having sex with a man. Or adultery. Bankers and investors are an abomination before the Lord. Superannuation and having a bank account is an abomination before the Lord because to charge or to receive interest is an abomination. Shellfish and pork are abominations and mixed fabrics are abominations. The point that many people smarter than me have made is all of this stuff is more about how do we separate ourselves from the cultures around us and maintain our identity. Abomination is about doing Jewish stuff that keeps us Jewish and separate, not so much about morality. So we are the people... Don't commit adultery, that's good. Men don't sleep with men. We don't sleep with our women when they're having periods. We don't charge interest. We don't have banks. We don't eat shellfish or pork. That's how you can tell if you're Jewish. And we don't wear mixed fabrics. Okay. We're just going to make it. So, in the pre-human social time before humans came along, your neighbour was basically your pack or your partner. Every organism until humans came along have wanted to maximise their breeding potential. That's what sex has been all about, having as many kids as you can and hoping they'll survive. And guarding your territory from others who might take resources from you. In the Old Testament, it's about loving neighbour as self still, but the neighbour is the tribe or the nation. Maximise your breeding and protect your property. Protect women and young a bit, guard your territory, build this earthly kingdom. As I said, polygamy is good, breeding is good, men are in control, women are vulnerable, there's no contraception or safe sex, prostitution is fine if you're a bloke, and barrenness is shameful. Early New Testament, your neighbour is everyone. Maybe all Christians, maybe everyone, it depends a little bit. Breeding and property are irrelevant because the world's about to end. We're building a heavenly kingdom. 
biological families have no more hold over us. You need to leave your wife, your kids, your husband, your mother, your father, if that's standing in the way of the kingdom. And we want to distinguish ourselves from the pagan religions with all of their temple cults and protect women, especially stopping men dumping them by divorce. Later in the New Testament, it's still about loving God and neighbour as self. But the world didn't end, so we need to start thinking about property again. We're ambivalent about breeding. Women have more equality. We're all being persecuted, so let's not stand out too much from the community around us so they can stop burning us to death and blaming us for everything. And the actual value regarding uh, sexual acts and relationships and property and children have been changing, in other words, in these different contexts. So where are we now? Well, we have more reliable contraception. It's certainly not 100%. We have safer sex. It's not completely safe. We have this big gap between puberty and marriage that we have to work out what we're doing in. Men and women are more equal. I think that would be fair to say. Our society is more stable and property has become pretty entrenched in the way we operate. As we said yesterday, it seems strange that Jesus calls us so much to uh, renounce all our possessions and follow him and we'll have nowhere to lay our head and all that stuff. And yet we all own houses and mortgages and build churches on street corners and stay quite put. Maybe we're apocalyptic. Maybe you think the world's about to end, in which case can I encourage you not to get married and have children? Maybe you think the world's going to continue for at least another couple of thousand years as it has so far, in which case you might be open to the idea of marriage. We're very individualistic. We're very nuclear. It very much comes down to uh, men and women, husbands and wives in particular, to provide all of that kind of social needs that we have. We're much more isolated from each other than we used to be in a lot of Australia. We're more wealth, more equal in a way, but there's a bigger gap globally between rich and poor. And so here's, that's Jesus' world. 300 million people spread around the entire globe. Here we are heading for 12 billion people. That's got to mean something when we think about what it means in terms of whether we should be reproducing ourselves. The call might well have been back in the days of Genesis, you know, uh, multiply and subdue and fill the earth. I think we've done that now. What is a Christian sexual ethic now in this incredibly exploding population going to mean? And let me jump to the end, I think by offering this summary. I'm really more interested in you thinking about that question for yourselves, but here was my crack at it. So in the Old Testament, we want to respect property rights. We want to care for children. We want to protect people and especially women from poverty. All of that's good. I think we should bring that with us. In the New Testament, further the uh, equality between men and women, and we should be doing that too. Make sure relationships don't separate us from our neighbour or the kingdom of God. And that sounds like a good thing to do. Love self, that still sounds good. Love the other and do for them as we'd have them do for us. So maybe a modern and traditional Christian approach to marriage would be something like this. I think it's absolutely clear that the idea that monogamous heterosexual marriage has been the only way that humans have uh, reproduced and had their relationships and formed societies is absolutely dead in the water. That is just absolutely not true that that's the way we've done it. At its best, it was still treated incredibly ambiguously by Jesus and Paul. And I think it's lost its claim to be created directly by God as if it fell out of the sky, as this is the way we do things. Once we know that the way we have relationships now are part of an evolutionary response with different expressions as our culture has changed and our environment has changed, then lifelong heterosexual marriage loses its moral high ground and its givenness in relationship to other forms of relationship. So the question becomes, what sort of relationships best express our faith in this environment that we live in now? And it will be different for different people here. Is the relationship one in which I'm free to love God and myself and others? Whether the relationship lasts for half an hour, we'd hope for a bit more than that, but I've been dumped within half an hour, I reckon, at least once in my life, or a lifetime. Is it undermining my love of God and myself and other people, or is it enhancing it? Is it stabilising society, or is the relationship that I'm choosing to be in destabilising society? And what would God prefer? Remembering that Jesus did a whole lot of destabilising in his life. Is it good news for me and other people? Thanks, Jason. Hopefully that's given you a few things to think about, including sea slugs next time you go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs>